How do you know when the news stories you read and the data analysis supporting those stories is true? In this video, we're going to be looking at some spurious uses of data by the news media as a springboard to learn when to use percentages of numbers versus absolute numbers. What's up my fellow lovers of data? This is Max from Data Launchpad, where we launch your data career into the stratosphere. Remember that 75.3% of subscribers to the channel land their dream job within three months and that 42.7% of statistics are made up. So subscribe now to make sure that you know how to tell the real statistics from the not so real. Let's have some fun and school them with data. What you guys may not know is that being a data scientist or a data analyst is not just about coding to pull some numbers, it's about pulling the right numbers, about interpreting those numbers correctly and about telling the right story with those numbers. So providing us with a hilarious example of what not to do as a data analyst is a newspaper story out of Sydney, Australia. Bush stampede. Sydney siders flee for the bush. Sydney siders have been fleeing for regional parts of New South Wales, using the coronavirus pandemic to look for work and affordable housing outside the nation's most expensive city. At first, I wondered how I'd missed it. But before I transferred my life savings to Bitcoin and drove into the countryside, I remembered that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And as we'll see, the authors have misused statistics in such an incredibly basic way that I actually feel bad calling them out for it. I mean, almost feel bad, because what's more important than their feelings is that we get to learn the true story, the true state of affairs, that you get to learn how to call bull on dodgy statistics and tell true, compelling stories with your data analysis. So, what did they get wrong? Well, the authors of this newspaper article fell into one of the classic traps of data analysis, and that is using absolute numbers when percentages relative numbers are more appropriate. So let's review the article, we'll run some quick numbers in Excel, and then we'll, we'll see where they went wrong and we'll take some lessons away to make our data analysis more robust. During the September quarter, a net 7,782 people left the Greater Sydney region, three in five of them moving to a regional part of New South Wales, data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics shows. That's a lot of people. But the question is, compared to what? And this is our first lesson for today, that the same number can be good or bad, it can be big or small, dependent on its context, dependent on what population we are comparing it to. So compared to the number of friends I have, 7,000, yeah, that's a lot. Compared to the number of people on Bondi Beach, yeah, that's a lot. To the number of subscribers I have, yeah, that's a lot. But the numbers are not talking about those populations, they're talking about Sydney siders. They're trying to persuade us that Sydney siders in general are leaving the city. So we compare to the total number of Sydney siders. Now the way in which we compare two numbers is with a percentage. A percentage is a number from 1 to 100 that makes it easy for us to understand if one number is big or small compared to another. It's like changing the size of this family photo to see how tall the daughter is better. It doesn't matter how we change the size of the photo, mum and dad are always twice the height of their daughter. And it's much easier to see now. In the same way, instead of comparing our actual absolute number to our actual population size, we transform that comparison into one with the same relative difference but smaller absolute numbers, that's out of 100 to be precise, numbers that are easier to understand. Now the thing about percentages is that they especially help us understand numbers of bigger magnitudes and complexities. For example, if you told me that 156 million of the world's 7.9 billion people have red hair, it's hard for me to fathom what that means until you mention that that's 2%, or two in every 100. Now I can see it, and redheads are pretty rare. And the reason percentages are so important when using large numbers is because insignificant amounts of a large population can seem very large in absolute terms and totally mess up the point that we take away from the number. 156 million gingers is so many people compared to the hundreds of people that I see in my daily life. 
that you'd forgive me for worrying that the gingers could rise up against us at any moment, subjugating us as slaves in a new kind of ginger world order. Of course, until we realise that that's only 2% of the population and that we could and would and will, if necessary, crush their pitiful rebellion. But that's kind of an easy one because we roughly know the world's population. We can roughly work out that 156 million versus 7.9 billion is a pretty small proportion. We know a percentage makes more sense. But what if you don't know the size of the population and you're simply not told? Consider this nonsense clickbait. Australia, the deadliest in the world for shark attacks in 2020. Now that article was true because eight out of 12 shark deaths happened in Australia in 2020. But what about compared to the roughly 170,000 total deaths? Barely registers. But you wouldn't hear a headline about heart disease or suicide being the leading causes of death because they just don't get the clicks. So a 1 billion US healthcare spending bill sounds expensive until you consider it's only 0.1% of the total $1 trillion healthcare spending in the United States. Eight shark deaths sounds like a lot until you realize that it's only 0.005% of the total 170,000 deaths in Australia. And hearing the Baltimore Orioles won 20 baseball games in a season sounds pretty impressive until you realize that that's only 12% of their total 162 games. Percentages are just easier for our caveman brains to wrap our heads around. And so we rightly see these numbers as drops in an ocean. When we see the percentages, we see how silly it would be to characterize a $1 billion healthcare spending bill as a spending spree or eight shark deaths as Jaws 5, or 20 Orioles victories as the Orioles being back to form. And so in each of these cases, insignificant amounts of that population, small percentages of that population, can seem very large. That's why we always need to look in context of the population at the percentage for large numbers. So back to our article, what we need to look at is not just the absolute number of Sydney siders who are leaving, but we need to look at the percentage, the percentage of Sydney siders who are leaving to the total population of Sydney. That's going to give us a relative number, a number out of 100, and it's going to give us a good idea of what Sydney siders are doing. Are they leaving in a stampede to the bush, or are they just simply relaxing on Bondi Beach like any other day? Let's jump into Excel quickly, and let's work it out and see what we find. So we've opened up Google Sheets or Excel, and what we want to do is compare the absolute number of people who are fleeing Sydney, this 7,782, to the population of Sydney, which is 5.4 million. So what we're going to do is to really simply, and this is literally how simple it is, take 7,782 and put it over, divide it by 5.4 million. And there we go, we get 0.15%. And if we round it to the nearest percent, just to make it simpler to kind of understand, it's basically no one is leaving. No one is leaving Sydney, which is to say that this 7,782 is a paltry, insignificant, tiny number when compared to the total population of Sydney. So what has our quick analysis shown and what can we learn from it? Well apart from the fact that you and I will never be able to afford a house in Sydney, there are two main things we can take away. The first is that the headline and the conclusion of this newspaper article were totally false. They were utterly false. The idea of a bush stampede, people fleeing toward the city, just wasn't supported by the evidence. It took you and I two minutes in Excel to find that 0% of Sydney siders left in the quarter. It's hardly a stampede. And not only does the data that they presented simply not support their conclusion, it directly contradicts their conclusion. And this isn't data that I've gone away and found elsewhere. This is data that is in the article itself. It's the very same data that they presented. Scary, right? But the second and more subtle problem with this article is that if you and I hadn't been so data savvy, if we hadn't paid attention, if we hadn't been just a little bit skeptical of what numbers and evidence we were fed and the stories we were told, 
then this contradictory data might have been pretty convincing. And that's the trouble with data analysis, that using data can often shroud spurious conclusions with a certain air of intellectual rigour. Basically, it makes your story seem more legit. So we've been pretty tough on the old Sydney Morning Herald today, and to be honest, they do deserve it. They should know better. This is a very basic error. But at the same time, basic errors happen for a reason. We and our caveman lizard brains are not set up to do data analysis properly. It's really hard to avoid basic errors all of the time, and that's why I want to recognise um, the paper for actually doing some things right. They were right to go to the Bureau of Statistics and find the actual correct number of people who are migrating out of Sydney. They were right to use a net number, 7,000, that accounted for people coming back into Sydney. And they were right to talk to researchers, to talk to experts, to outsource the expertise. It was purely in the interpretation of that expertise that things went wrong. What's so amazing about this is that they actually had the answer that we've discussed in the article, but decided to ignore it for the headline and the main point of the article. Professor Randolph down here said that the number of people leaving the city was not significant. Now, is this particular article a huge problem? No, of course it isn't. It's a, an insignificant kind of article that I've plucked out of the population section of the newspaper to ruthlessly use to try and grow my YouTube channel. However, I would argue that it's not an isolated incident. It's actually quite a common thing to misuse statistics in this way, in more important stories, in media, in government, in business, anywhere where a good story is more important than the truth. This article is merely a warning to us to pay attention to the context of numbers so that we don't get fooled into believing any old story or the story someone else wants us to believe, that we believe the true story and we know why. So let's boil what we've learned down into three lessons to make it easier to remember. Firstly, I want you to always ask compared to what. The very same number can be good or bad, big or small, based on its context, based on what population we're comparing it to. Now, the second lesson is that these comparisons, which, which we make with percentages, are especially important when dealing with large populations, because even insignificant amounts of large populations can be very big in absolute terms and totally skew the point that we take away from the data. And finally, remember to always treat data with a skeptical eye, because data is often twisted to suit somebody's purposes and tell their story. Not only that, makes it sound more legit. 100% of people who watch my videos and subscribe press the subscribe button. So make sure you're one of them and that you don't fall for stats like that in future.